This is the Caldonan Stone on display here at Timespans Museum in Helmsdale in the far north of Scotland. This ancient rock has returned home after a space odyssey by Scotland's first astronaut, Dave Mackay. But I'm here to tell you about another journey, an epic journey where old and new worlds collided over 200 years ago. The story starts only a few miles away from here, that direction. This is the Strath of Kildonan in the Scottish Highlands. Today, it's part of the most sparsely populated area in Europe. In the late 18th century, however, things were very different. These broad hill valleys, or straths, would have been filled with people scraping a living from the land, scattered about in small farming townships. It was a scene that was common all over the highlands. The people grew crops, grazed their livestock on sheer grounds, and spun wool into clothes. It was a lifestyle of complete self-sufficiency that had remained intact for thousands of years. But the markets at home and abroad for meat plummeted and their demand for wool and sheep rose dramatically. The straths were now seen as a vital commodity by the landowners. And so, in the early 19th century, this ancient way of life was brought to an abrupt end by sheep farming on an industrial scale. The old world the Highlanders knew was now dying, and fearing the worst, some people chose to leave. But many people had no choice but to leave through forced removals and evictions. Regardless, the net result was a mass exodus of people known as the Highland Clearances. One person who left from this actual very township of Guilable behind me was a young single woman called Catherine McPherson, or Kate to her friends. Kate's journey has been described as the most gruelling and protracted ever made by an emigrant from Europe to North America. In May 1813, with around 100 other natives from the Strath of Kildonan, Kate McPherson set out for the banks of the Red River in the prairie country of Canada. The party who became known as the Selkirk Settlers started their epic quest by walking nearly 50 miles to the north coast at Caithness. Carrying what they could, the emigrants walked many of those miles over one of the largest areas of blanket bog in the world, the Flow Country. Exhausted, the settlers arrived here at Scrabster, just outside Thurzo. At night, Kate slept on the hard ground, and in the morning she dragged her aching body to the small harbour nearby this very spot, where some small boats were waiting to take her across the Pentland Firth to Orkney. Today, I'm going to be crossing in this state-of-the-art modern ferry. You can actually see Orkney from Scrabster. It's only about 30 miles, but don't be fooled for a moment. The first 15 miles are across the most dangerous stretch of waters around the British coast. There are three sea currents that converge to create one of the world's fastest tidal systems. These waters have claimed countless vessels and lives over the years. I'm on a big modern ferry and I can feel it rolling about a bit and it's pretty good conditions overall. I can't imagine what it must have been like for Kate crossing these dangerous waters in a small boat of around 15 foot in length. The ferry is not long docked here in Stromness, and all the holidaymakers have departed, gone to see the sights and stay in their comfortable accommodation. For Kate and the settlers, things were not so pleasant. The ship that was to take them across the Atlantic was yet to arrive from Europe, so they had to wait it out in basically what I would call an internment camp. 
Now, if you've ever seen images in the media today of refugees and asylum seekers staying in such places, you'll know the conditions are pretty awful. In fact, Kate's lodgings were so bad, many of the settlers were getting headaches, fevers and rashes all over their body. When the proudly named ship, the Prince of Wales, eventually arrived, it was all go loading cargo, passengers and that most precious commodity of all, fresh water. Over my shoulder here is Logan's Well, just a stone's throw from the ferry terminal in Stromness. Some of the most famous ships in history have stopped here and filled their casks with fresh water. Captain Cook, Sir John Franklin, to name but a couple, both filled their vessels from Logan's Well. When the Prince of Wales eventually set sail, Kate must have looked back with a heavy heart. But she was at last underway and her destiny lay before her. But a cruel twist of fate was about to deal a harsh blow to the fully laden emigrant ship. The settlers were heading to Canada as part of a colonisation project set up by Thomas Douglas, the 5th Earl of Selkirk. By the turn of the 19th century, Lord Selkirk had become a leading shareholder in the Hudson's Bay Company, which traded in fur pelts across Canada's vast wilderness. In 1811, he was granted land by the company, a vast area about five times the size of Scotland, the district which the people from Kildonan would settle was named Assiniboia. Lord Selkirk no doubt saw potential for gain in his venture, which offered a supply base of food and labour for the growing fur trading company. But he also disapproved of the Highland clearances, especially the manner in which the people were being turned out of their homes through forced evictions and even the burning of their longhouses. At a time when the brutality of the clearances in Scotland were at their most severe, when the Highlanders desperately needed help the most, to such a persecuted people, Lord Selkirk must have appeared as a rescuing angel with the prospect of a better life in the bountiful prairies. Opinions today are still divided about Lord Selkirk and, as we shall see later, the manner in which he developed the Red River Colony to many descendants of the settlers, however, his name is still held in high regard as someone who cared enough for his Scots kin to offer them salvation. He is an important figure in the story of Kate Macpherson, and his project helped play out some of the key episodes in her epic adventure. But as we shall see, it was no simple task to get Kate and the settlers across the Atlantic to Red River in the days of the Ocean Greyhounds. The Prince of Wales had not long set sail from Stromness in June 1813 when the symptoms of the passengers that were evident on land now revealed their true magnitude that dread of all ships of the time, typhus. The situation was dire as new cases of the disease sprouted with the fleas and lice brought on board by the infested emigrants. Onboard conditions certainly didn't help. Contemporary shipping laws of the days stipulated space required for the slaves, but none existed for the transportation of emigrants. When the ship Sarah left Fort William in 1801 for Pictou, Nova Scotia, she was by law only allowed to carry 489 slaves. 
Her actual cargo on that journey was almost 700 emigrants squeezed into dank and unsanitary conditions. The reputation of these vessels and their perilous voyages gave them the unnerving nickname Coffin Ships. Kate was well underway on her Atlantic crossing, but people were now dying. La Serre, the ship's doctor, was doing his best to care for the passengers as Kate looked on in trepidation. Without hesitation and regard for her own circumstance, the young lass in the Highlands stepped in to help La Serre nurse the petrified emigrants. These were her people and she would not stand by and do nothing. In August 1813, the Prince of Wales entered Hudson's Bay and headed for a derelict outpost on the north shores of Churchill, some 70 miles short of York Factory, the intended landing spot. Captain MacDonald, fearing the worst for his crew and himself, decided to put the settlers ashore without delay. After much consternation and the prospect of leaving the settlers to inevitable further deaths, the captain reluctantly agreed to take them to York Factory, where the vital food and shelter was awaiting them. But it was just moments after departing Churchill that the ship ran aground on the sandbanks. Whether this was intentional by Captain MacDonald is not known for sure. But we do know he desperately wanted an end to the whole ill-fated affair. Here, the impoverished settlers had no option but to set up camp at this desolate spot, a place that in time became known as Colony Creek. If you look at York Factory on a map, you can virtually draw a straight line across to Kildonan, but due to moving ocean currents, Scotland is kept at a much warmer temperature than would normally be at its given latitude. Here, it is actually possible to grow certain tropical plants, while Hudson's Bay is an area often subject to frozen subarctic conditions. The settlers knew they must walk to York Factory to get the much needed provisions. Seriously ill prepared for the severity of conditions as temperatures plummeted sub-zero, they embarked on a three week trek expecting to find relief as arranged. But it was an unfulfilled promise and from all accounts Lord Selkirk's agents had not met their obligations as agreed. Too late in the season to make for Red River, the settlers were forced to overwinter at York Factory. With only crude huts for shelter, the settlers dug in as best they could. By January 1814, 12 of the settlers had died of fever, whilst many more were in a much deprived condition as temperatures dropped to an incredible minus 40 degrees. When Dr. La Serre eventually succumbed to typhus, everyone looked to Kate for care of the party. By all accounts, Kate and the settlers suffered a terrible first winter in Canada. As her troubles deepened, the freezing breath of the north wind howled day after day, week after week. A religious person from birth, even Kate's staunch faith must have shivered to the core as she surely must have thought to herself, gazing at her frightened friends, where is now thy God? In April 1814, it was decided that around 51 of the young and strong, including Kate McPherson, would attempt to walk the 700 miles of rock, marsh and ice from York Factory to the Red River. This would be an ultimate challenge for any explorer today with all their modern equipment. For a ravaged party of Scots exiles in an unknown continent using handmade snowshoes and the barest of provisions, their three-month odyssey has become legendary in local folklore. Kate's resolve and stamina was such that it is said she strengthened the waverers in line 
all the way to Red River. Kate met the challenges that arose on the journey with great fortitude and was one of the leading voices as the group progressed. In fact, women like Kate had it much tougher in many ways to the men. It was the women who carried the heaviest load and when day's trek was done, their chores continued as they set up camp, prepared meals and looked after the general well-being of the group. Conventions of the day also meant Highland women didn't wear trousers. Instead, they wore a long, bag style skirt with underlayers. These heavy, absorbent materials made the going mile after mile, often through thigh-deep snow, extremely difficult. When the settlers eventually arrived at Red River in autumn 1814, they were assigned lands, but incredibly no tools to till the soil or sufficient food to tide them over meantime. Even more troubling was that the settlers found themselves on the eve of great disturbances between two rival fur trading companies. The settlers, who were under the protectorate of the Hudson's Bay Company, were soon subject to attacks by the Northwest Company, who saw access to supplies and expansion threatened by the establishment of the new colony. 1815 was an era of great feuds between the two companies. When a second party of settlers, also from Kuldonan, arrived in 1816, they found nothing but scattered and abandoned homes. The colony was virtually destroyed, and with it, their Kuldonan friends had scattered to the four winds. When warring reached a height in 1816 with the Battle of Seven Oaks, 21 men were either killed or badly wounded. But Kate and a small band of hardy settlers did remain at the site defiant. Her faith was resolute that dreams of a new life would not end here in carnage. Looking to salvage the remains of his beleaguered project, Lord Selkirk arrived in 1817 with a band of 100 Scots soldier settlers. Order was soon restored and many of the dispersed settlers returned to the settlement. But here we have one of the great tragic ironies of the Red River Colony. By this time there was a network of thousands of voyageurs, French Canadians who transported the fur pelt by canoe from the north to Quebec. Most of them had taken an indigenous wife, and their offspring became known as the Metis. When the settlers arrived in the middle of this fur trade battle zone, they unknowingly ended up displacing the Metis from their birth lands. Lord Selkirk had removed all indigenous claims to the lands for stability of his project. Having herself witnessed land removals firsthand in Kildonan, when Kate realised the situation, she may have, with immense mixed emotion, realised that both the Metis and the Highlanders were both at the hands of mighty enterprises and people who saw them as pawns in a power play for control of territory. In tribute to Kate and the others who remained loyal at his Red River settlement, Lord Selkirk renamed the district Kildonan. In time, a church was built, a place for mourning and rejoicing, a place of gathering and giving thanks. One of the few items Kate had with her all the way was her Bible. In it was a frayed ribbon with the words, Lord, teach me to pray, humbly stitched. Well, Kate prayed 
and her faith in divine providence remained with her to the end. If her belief for a better life was godly, her survival is surely the stuff of miracles. In total, it took Kate one year over 4,000 miles of land, sea and arctic tundra to reach her final destination. Given Kate's view of the world was just a few miles of hill land around her home when she left the highlands of Scotland, it's hard to imagine just how big a leap into the unknown this was at that time. Going to the moon would be easier to accomplish today. When Kate left her humble longhouse in the Strath of Kildonan, she was sacrificing everything for a better way of life. On her deathbed, Kate's words were reported to have been, if I could only see the hills of home one last time. Unlike the Kildonan stone, which returned to its place of origins, Kate would never see her home or country again. <laughs> <laughs>